Hi, I'm Taronish Pithawala, Technical Lead for Geophysical Modeling at Geosoft. This episode is one of a five-part series on inversion best practices. In this video, you'll learn about the importance of auxiliary information in inversion and how to choose parameters for an efficient and accurate inversion model. If you missed the introductory video for this web series, check it out online or continue on. In the introductory video, we glimpse the process behind inversion and now we can think about the auxiliary information put into an inversion model. And that's basically everything input by the user except for the observed data. Auxiliary information affects both the data misfit and the model norm described by these non-exact expressions here. In truth, there's a lot more going on. An example of a piece of auxiliary information in the data space is a trend that is identified and removed by the user. The regional residual separation has a profound impact on the inversion result and requires serious thought from the user. Auxiliary information is also critical in the model space and can be quite complex. Input parameters such as depth weighting, gradient, and focusing all affect the model norm and the inversion result. The numerical representation of the Earth, given by the predicted and reference models, implicitly contain auxiliary information as well. The discretization of the Earth is controlled by the user. Parameters such as cell size, expansion ratio, and padding cells all impact the inversion result. In addition, users can specify whether the rock properties being modeled are parameterized as scalars or vectors. In the introductory video, I mentioned a class of models that result from the inversion of a given data set. The decision for the algorithm to settle on a particular model is strongly governed by the auxiliary parameters given by the user. Moreover, the recreation of any inversion result depends on the choice of auxiliary inputs. Now that we see why auxiliary information is important, I can identify some best practices around key parameters like model cell size, data sampling, error assignment and type, and trend removal. The aim is to correctly choose these parameters in order to obtain the best inversion result as efficiently as possible. On the note of efficiency, we first turn to cell size. The number of cells in your discretized Earth model impacts the amount of time Voxy takes to compute your result. The goal is to find a cell size that allows for the most reasonable inversion model in the shortest amount of time. There are a number of rules of thumb that have been used by inversion scientists. One idea was to choose a cell size that matched the desired resolution. That is, I want to resolve 5 meter bodies, so I will choose a 5 meter cell size. Which is not an unreasonable thing to say, but it's not that simple. What about the ability for the survey method to resolve 5 meter bodies in the first place? And what about the geometry of the survey? Some say that you ought to discretize your earth model based on line spacing, usually one quarter to one half the distance between lines similar to what you would do with gridding. This works sometimes, but doesn't address the subtleties of the problem. What if your target bodies are varying in size and depth? Similar to the first idea, some would argue that more cells are better. But again, we run into the same concerns. To investigate the optimum model cell size, I present a synthetic model which includes dipping prisms, small plates, and dipping dikes, at various depths with variable line spacing increasing to the north. We compute the TMI response of the synthetic model and then invert the data with varying cell sizes. I'll set my benchmark at 10 meter cells and compare the other models to this one. In this first slide we see the 10 meter cell benchmark model clipped to 0.01 SI and a 20 meter cell model also clipped to 0.01 SI. We note that the models are similar, and when we view the difference between the two, we note that increasing line spacing to the north did not exacerbate the result. As we increase the cell size to 40 meters, we notice that the models are still fairly similar. The differences between the two are localized to the very tops of the shallowest bodies, yet we're still able to resolve the structure and depth extent of each body and see the distinction between the two dikes. At 80 meter cells, the bodies are still recovered, but the depth extent is less well resolved. Amplitude has decreased, and the two dikes are no longer distinctly modeled. At 120 meter cells, 
only the shape of the large bodies are recovered, but amplitudes are severely attenuated, and the smaller bodies at depth are barely resolved. The two parallel dikes are not resolved, and the difference between the two exceeds the similarities. Most interestingly, we note that the difference between the models is not really affected by the increasing line separation to the north. This indicates that optimum cell size is not really a function of the line spacing, but rather a function of the source sensor spacing. If we look at a cross-sectional slice through one of our dipping plates, you'll note that there is very little difference in your resulting interpretation as you increase the cell size from 10 to 40 meters. In summation, we find that the optimum cell size is not a function of line spacing, but rather the source sensor separation. The best cell size, then, is the largest one that allows you to adequately represent the field data with an anti-aliased signal desampled to one data point per cell. For airborne magnetics, this translates to a rule of thumb of approximately one-half to one times the minimum source sensor separation. Speaking of data sampling, let's turn to another auxiliary tip for improving the efficiency of your inversion. In Voxy, your data is filtered and desampled by default as seen in this dialog box here. Why do we recommend you optimize your data sampling using this option? To answer that, let's first look at this example of an airborne magnetic survey. In this plan map, I've displayed the gridded survey data, the location for each field observation with black ticks, and the cells of our inversion model, shown as the black grid. You'll note that each cell has many field observations but you'll also recall that the spatial frequency content of the predicted response is limited by the Nyquist frequency associated with the chosen cell size. Therefore, any frequency greater than the Nyquist cannot be represented by the cells in the model mesh. This means that it is an extraneous computational effort to include all of the field observations when you can adequately represent the field data with an anti-alias signal desampled to one data point per cell. The Voxy sampling routine spatially filters and subsamples the data to avoid aliasing, and then calculates the mean value and average XYZ location for each representative observation for each cell. We see here a sample of our gridded data, the locations for all of our observed points, and then the filtered, desampled data points resulting from our optimization routine. Since this routine is dependent on cell size, it is crucial that when selecting the cell size, you take into account the frequency content of your data, which in turn is dependent on the source sensor separation. This graph demonstrates the result of optimizing your data sampling using the Voxy routine. The green points are the observations directly from the input database, and the red points are the representative observations after data sampling optimization to one sample per cell. A small, illustrative example is a magnetic inversion I ran using data acquired over the Ring of Fire in Ontario, Canada. This 64 by 61 cell inversion without optimized data sampling converged to a solution after three iterations in approximately one minute. The number of data points used in the inversion was approximately 4,800. Changing nothing else, this 64 by 61 cell inversion with optimized data sampling converged to a solution after three iterations in only 15 seconds. The number of data points used in this inversion was approximately 700. You'll note that the results are not very different, proving that you do not sacrifice the model results by optimizing data sampling. The faster inversion, in this case, was approximately four times faster, but we've seen that for larger inversion models, the improvement in speed can be on the order of 10,000 times. Moving on to another important piece of auxiliary information, I'll speak a little bit about the error type and misfit distribution. Looking back at the equation for the data misfit, we see where the data error is applied to the inversion, but how about how it's applied? Surely there's more to it than just some variable delta d. In reality, both the type of error that is how the error is distributed across the data space, and the size of the error affect the inversion solution. Understanding how the size of the error impacts the solution is straightforward. The larger the error value, 
the larger the difference between the observed data and the predicted data is allowed to be. This permits more flexibility in the inversion and will often result in a very smooth model. Understanding how the type of error impacts the solution requires some illustration. Let us consider a synthetic model suite with a dipping prism, some plates, and a dike. The red bodies here have a higher susceptibility and so their signal dominates the magnetic response. The green bodies will result in a more subtle feature. After forward modeling the synthetic bodies, I've added some noise to the resulting response and will cut a cross-sectional slice through here. I then proceed to invert the data with two types of error assignment, a relative error of 8% taken at each data point, and an absolute error of 10 nanoteslas applied to every data point. The results illustrate the effects of error type clearly. When applying a relative error of 8%, we see that smaller anomalies are assigned lower error values, and so the inversion is forced to fit these more closely. Larger anomalies are assigned very large error values, and so the inversion is permitted to deviate from the observed data. When applying an absolute error of 10 nanoteslas to each observation point, we see that larger anomalies are fitted more closely whereas smaller signals are more difficult to resolve. The two small dipping plates are barely seen in the result at all. In conclusion, we find that for areas with large dynamic range, it is helpful to work with relative errors as more subtle features will be illuminated more clearly. For areas with a more uniform response, the absolute error provides a more uniform misfit distribution and will emphasize model features equally. The last auxiliary parameter we'll look at in this web series is trend removal. The topic of trend removal is a widely discussed one, and there are many methodologies that speak to a preferred approach. What I'll outline in this presentation is the motivation for trend removal and how even simple methods can impact your inversion result. When modeling a particular area, we'll often find that there are contributions to the regional signal from sources that are not our targets of interest. Trends often arise due to deep or peripheral sources and can convolute the interpretation of our primary targets. Removing this signature is an auxiliary input that is done with a variety of methods. Commonly, you can remove a mean from the data or a first or second order trend. You can also remove a modeled contribution, though this is more complex to do. Illustrating this idea, we have a simple diagram of a model with a target body in red and a deeper basement structure in brown. Removing the trend due to the basement structure makes it easier to interpret the response. Similarly, removing a trend from the data improves the inversion's ability to resolve the target body. We apply this to a real data set using the Cannington deposit in Queensland, Australia. Active mining and drilling in the area have defined the structure of the deposit quite well. The dark blue shape outlined in each of these models is the known outline of the Cannington deposit. The TMI data was inverted with a mean, a linear trend, and a quadratic trend removed. We see that the inversion result is improved significantly with even a simple linear trend removal. A second order trend improves the result further. We can resolve the depth extent and the dip of the deposit far better and that's because the inversion can focus its efforts on modeling the target bodies instead of outside contributors. If we look at the padding domain we can see this concept clearly. When only a mean value is removed from the data set the inversion must compensate by placing peripheral sources in the padding cells. This makes it more difficult for the inversion to fit the observed data we care most about, the response due to the target bodies. We find that in the absence of a complex regional residual separation from forward modeling, it is best to use at least a linear trend removal to best model the target bodies within the model space. It's also a good idea to view the padding domain of your result. If you see a great deal of structure or amplitude in the lateral and vertical extremities of your model, your inversion in the area of interest can likely be improved with a better trend removal. This episode of our Inversion Best Practice web series 
focused on the effects of auxiliary information. I presented key parameters that can result in the most efficient computation of an accurate inversion model using Voxy. If you would like more information on other auxiliary parameters, watch Rob Ellis's full-length ASCG 2013 presentation on auxiliary parameters for inversion at www.geosoft.com. Our next episode will present Voxy's acceleration settings and how to use them to improve the results and efficiency of your large regional scale inversions. Stay tuned for more!